Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris of the Ancient Scholar. I hope you guys are doing well today. Hey, I'd uh, like to talk about a somewhat of a novel therapeutic uh, method that is becoming uh, more popular in certain systems, and I want to push for the popularity of this method. Um, full disclosure, I have no uh, financial interests in um, any of this information I'm about, I'm about to disseminate. This really comes down to a practical tool that every EMS provider, every advanced level EMS provider really should have in their toolbox. And um, <clears throat> let's just start this off with a quick scenario to a Gedanken, a thought experiment to help demonstrate the utility of uh, this particular technique. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say that you've been called to the scene of a, a long-term care facility, a nursing home, something on the lines of that. Um, you arrive to uh, find a 78-year-old male patient. The patient uh, has altered mental status. He is profoundly uh, hypotensive and uh, appears to be moribund. He's knocking on death's door, essentially. Um, you get on scene, you begin uh, providing positive pressure ventilation. He's uh, profoundly hypotensive. Um, you're considering an intubation. Perhaps you even have uh, protocols or clinical practice guidelines that allow you to intubate, you're considering that. You have this really hypotensive patient and you need to stabilize this patient's vital signs and you need to do it rather quickly. So traditionally, what have we taught EMS providers? Well, traditionally, we've taught EMS providers to first think about a fluid bolus, right? So we'll administer fluid, uh, fluid challenge uh, <clears throat> depending on additional history, 250, 500 milliliters in a patient like this who may have some underlying cardiovascular pathophysiology for all we know. Okay, that's gonna take a little, a little while, right? All right, put some fluids into this patient. Okay, so we've got a fluid bolus going. Um, the patient may or may not be improving, but we we have this actively crashing patient who is, who is really critical um, and we really need to augment that patient's hemodynamics with uh, some sort of pharmaceutical agent. Now classically, in EMS at least, this is classically comes down to a, a medication called dopamine, right? Or at least that's what we all talk about and that's what we all verbalize and we all spit out. Dopamine, 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 right? Everybody pretty much knows the dose of dopamine. That's uh, two to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And in a patient like this, we know that we're probably going to have to go for a presser dose, an inopressor dose, uh, because we probably want to increase inotropy and, um, and, and cause uh, some alpha effects, uh, alpha one effects to cause vasoconstriction, uh, to increase uh, blood pressure, increase cardiac output, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so we're probably looking at starting somewhere around 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Okay, here's the question I want to pose to you. Um, that question is, how rapidly can you pull your dopamine out of your med box, get your dopamine set up, calculate and actually calculate a proper flow rate and get that dopamine flowing into your patient in a reasonable amount of time? Um, I would suggest that this is, or I would, um, I would suppose that in many places, this is going to be a significant amount of time for most providers. Okay, that's just the reality that we face, and that's something that we need to to expect. Uh, even in a controlled didactic setting where where I work a lot as as an as as an EMS instructor I spend you know I do we teach an entire uh, course you know 6 68 70 hours of pharmacology about half of which is in the lab drilling our students on mixing drips okay at the end of this course after we've had the mix drips and hang drips it still <laughs> takes several minutes to get this going and, and that's just the reality that we face out in the field where, first of all, you're not doing this a lot, right? You're not hanging dopamine a lot, okay? That, that's the first, the first point. The second point is you're not practicing this a lot, okay? There are probably outlying systems where 
you probably may drill this, but I'm talking the bread and butter EMS provider. You're just not running into this a lot, right? You're not doing this a lot. So now you have this critical patient that you run into occasionally, right? This this septic nursing home patient, maybe they have a pneumonia or septic wound or or you could think of any any number of problems, uh, C, CHF or COPD patient that we're preparing to innovate that's profoundly hypotensive and we need to augment their blood pressure. We need to get their blood pressure augmented quickly, right? We've got a fluid bolus going or perhaps fluids aren't indicated or fluids have already been given. Um, whatever the case may be, right? We need to rapidly increase that blood pressure. And I am posing uh, an honest assessment of our, our capabilities as, as paramedics and, and, and EMS providers. And, and I'm saying that we probably are not going to be very quick at doing that, right? Getting the dopamine, getting a drip calculated, getting it up, getting it infusing on time at a proper dose and in a stress-tested environment, it, it, it's not going to happen. Um, the other thing is, dopamine has some really interesting properties, right? At modest modest doses, dopamine is not even a direct acting agent, right? Um, dopamine doesn't have a lot of direct effects on alpha alpha one and and beta one receptors, right? So you're giving it at you know 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute and at those doses, it may it causes some um, endogenous epinephrine, norepinephrine, to be released, and then, you know, hopefully that works. Well, what if I have this a septic patient or 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 a patient that's been in a shock state for an extended period of time that well, they may be catecholamine depleted, right? And and so now I'm giving a, an indirect acting agent to a catecholamine depleted patient probably not going to have great results with that medication. So now I even have more delay because I'm giving a medication like dopamine that doesn't have really profound direct effects until you get titrate this up to really much higher doses. And then, you know, we're, we're many minutes into the game here, right? And we've got a moribund crashing patient. We got to think about that, right? So what's the other option that we classically think of? Well, epinephrine, right? Okay. Mix an epinephrine drip. Do it. Get it up and get it going. See how fast it takes. Again, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you to be as honest as you possibly can. Put the ego aside and, and think about this. How quickly can you get an epinephrine drip up? Right? How many of you just pull out of the top of your head, oh, I need to mix one milligram into two, 250 milliliters and then run that at uh, two to 10 uh, micrograms per minute and uh, calculate an appropriate dose and appropriate flow rate and titrate that up and get it going, right? Are you mixing up epinephrine drips all the time? Are you pressure testing? Are you doing pressure tested training with these kinds of things? Probably not. Again, significant delay. So what to do, right? What to do? How can we rapidly stabilize these patients um, with a uh, with an inopressive agent like epinephrine and, and do it uh, with a technique, utilizing a technique that is, that is uh, rapid, that doesn't require significant amount of cognitive processing, i.e. Uh, dosage calculations, and, and something that's effective. Well, what is effective? Well, anesthesia, right? Let's, let's talk about an anesthesiologists, uh, anesthetists. You know, they've been doing something similar to this for, for, for decades, right? And that is um, they will give small boluses of vasopressors to stabilize blood pressure prior to and uh, during and, and perhaps after um, procedures, specifically when it comes to airway manipulation, airway management. Oftentimes, uh, the blood pressure tends to decrease when we perform airway procedures because we're giving medications that can cause vasodilation, myocardial suppression, etc. So this is a relatively commonly encountered um, issue in the anesthesia environment. And now that this concept is kind of filtering down, and, and the concept I really want to talk about Okay, hopefully, hopefully you guys are on board, right? The first part of this video was getting you on board with, okay, doing it the way that we may have learned, it leads to significant delays, it leads to medication errors, it's hard to do, we're not 
practicing it a lot. We're not practicing it under pressure tested conditions, yada, yada, yada. Hopefully you guys are on board. So what is an alternative? Well, the alternative is something called push dose pressors. Now we can use many different kinds of agents, right? We could use um, levofed or norepinephrine. We could use neosinephrine or phenethylene, um, phenethylene, whatever that, whatever, however it's announced, neosinephrine, right? It's a pure alpha agent um, for a vaso for its alpha one vasoconstrictive properties. Uh, norepinephrine, a levofed is another one that has fairly profound alpha effects, but uh, you know, the way I look at it is I'm not a physician and out in the field it is, it, it's not necessarily my job to be highly, highly nuanced in these really critical emergency situations that require rapid action. And, and, and so what I would propose is going with an agent that has a large amount of utility, an agent that can, can do lots of different things for us. Um, it can increase, it has inotropic effects. Uh, it can increase contractility, increase the heart rate perhaps. Um, it can cause bronchodilation. It can have um, alpha-1 effects and it can cause vascular constriction, increase the blood pressure, right? Um, and, and what's a good agent? Well, epinephrine really is one of the best agents, right? It's a direct acting agent. It's very, given uh, perennially IVIO, it's very rapid acting. Um, it has very potent alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 effects, right? So you can do lots of things with it. It has the greatest amount of utility, I think, for what we're trying to do as EMS providers. Okay, so how does this whole push dose epi thing work? Well, here's an easy method. There are, there are many ways we can do it. Here's one method, okay? So what do we do? Well, you take your, your epinephrine here, right? So here I've got epinephrine of cardiac epinephrine, one milligram in 10 milliliters. That's that one to 10,000 concentration. And we're actually phasing out the old labeling uh, the one to 10,000, we're just going with one milligram and 10 milliliters, and that's to simplify things, that is to decrease the, the incidence of uh, medication errors, right? So cardiac epinephrine, one milligram and 10 milliliters, all right? So one milligram is a thousand micrograms, right? So I got a thousand micrograms in a 10 milliliter syringe, and what does that give me? Well, that gives me 0 0.1 or 0 0.1 milligrams or 100 micrograms per milliliter. So for every milliliter of this, I have a hundred micrograms. Okay, so this is what you want to do. Take a 10 milliliter syringe, okay? Fill that 10 milliliter syringe with nine milliliters of saline, normal saline, okay? Put one milliliter, 100 micrograms, into that 10 milliliter syringe, right? Okay, so that'll be one milliliter, and now I have 10 milliliters, right? So I put one milliliter of epinephrine, one to 10,000, okay, or 100 micrograms, okay, in nine milliliters of saline, saline, and now mix it up, I've got 10 milliliters, right? 10 milliliters of or 100 micrograms of epinephrine here, okay? That's 10 micrograms per milliliter. Easy math, right? And I, I label that, right? Epinephrine, adrenaline. I've got 10 micrograms per milliliter, okay? Label my syringe, all right? And then what do I do? Every two to five minutes, I give this IV push. I give 0.5, to two milliliters every two to five minutes. That's five to 20 micrograms of epinephrine every two to five minutes. Uh, if you want to even simplify it more, give one milliliter every two minutes. If, if you need to, to stabilize that blood pressure, right? To get that heart rate up, to stabilize that blood pressure, uh, to help stabilize that patient, right? So one milliliter every two minutes, right? That's, um, um, <clears throat> That's 10 micrograms every two minutes, right? So I'm giving one milliliter IV push every two minutes, and that's what's called push dose um, pressors. It's push dose epinephrine, right? And and I don't have to do an epinephrine drip. I don't have to do a dopamine drip. I don't have to do a 
a uh, norepinephrine or a neosinephrine drip, right? I don't have to do any of that in the immediate stabilization period of my patient. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about I'm out in the field. I've just come into contact with a critical moribund crashing patient. I need to augment and stabilize that patient's hemodynamic status so they can survive the next several minutes of the resuscitation and ultimately survive transport to a more secure environment where drips and things like that can, can get done, right? So I can do this. This is a great bridge to infusion tool. It doesn't require complex dosage calculations and really all it requires is nine milliliters of saline in a, in a 10 milliliter syringe, mix in one milliliter of epinephrine one to 10,000 or one milligram 10 milliliters. You have 10 micrograms per milliliter and you can give one milliliter every two minutes or two to five minutes. Get that patient's blood pressure stabilized, get them intubated, loaded it up, transported, right? And you can augment them during a transport, particularly if you have a short transport time, right? You're just giving push boluses or push doses of epinephrine keeping that patient stabilized and getting them to definitive care or buying yourself time, right? Buying somebody time to slowly, methodically get the drip up, get, get it mixed and get things calculated and fusing um, without worry of um, dosage calculation problems, med errors and like that, right? You can take some of that pressure off whoever else is, is mixing that, or maybe yourself if you're the one mixing that um, infusion. Okay guys, so I think I've rambled on enough about this uh, particular tool. Um, it's a really good tool. Uh, if your service is not using this, I would strongly suggest that you um, approach your medical direction, whoever that may be, and explain this concept to them. And this is not just Chris Bear. This is a concept that many people are using. Um, there are uh, very respected providers who are using this. There's some data out on this. Uh, probably the most popular uh, reference that I, I could point you in the direction of is, is Dr. Scott Weingard, who uh, runs the EM Crit, the M Crit um, podcast, um, and is a very, very well respected in the emergency and critical care um, world. And you can actually check his podcast out, MCRIT podcast, and this specific concept of push dose pressors is, um, is, uh, is talked about, is discussed in quite some detail in a couple of different podcasts and some uh, posts uh, and some threads as well. So that would be a good reference, and that's actually, if you want to, approach your medical direction, um, that's another physician, right? This is, is something that's coming from a physician. Um, so there's some familiarity there and, and hopefully you can have some good discussion and dialogue with your medical direction. Hopefully you can articulate this um, in, in a way that makes sense, right? And it really does. It's, it's a practical, easy to employ tool um, that, that works, quite frankly. Uh, so there you go. Hopefully you guys found this, this video helpful and you know hopefully if you weren't aware of this, this might become a great tool for you to use as an EMS provider in the future. Okay guys, um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.